it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 79 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day and we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? This is Vienna Roast. And it's strong because I need it. It's good. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. Okay, so how are you doing? Busy for the fourth week in a row. Busy. (laughs) Right now, I'm trying to catch up on planting. I, at the last minute, decided I wanted to add even more veggies and food crops. So figuring out where to put all that has been taking up my time. How about you? Yeah. Well, that's the story of the week, right? Yeah. Yes, it is. (laughs) So we just want to let everybody know we are recording via Zoom today. In my household, we have COVID, two of us, and two of us do not. So we are erring on the side of caution and not getting together to record. And let me tell you, it hit Sophia and I like a ton of bricks and very hard. So bear with me and my voice this week, but I'm here. I'm profoundly grateful that I did not get this. I'm very sorry that the two of you caught it. You sound a lot better than you did. That's all I can say. Yeah, I did sleep for over three hours today in preparation for recording. (laughs) Power napping is what you do with this. Unfortunately, this one hit me worse than any of the others. Last Wednesday, I woke up with a little bit of a sore throat. I knew Sophia was positive already. I tested positive and boom, hit me with the 103.7 fever for days and the congestion and the weakness. I'm just trying to make it. There was an outbreak at the high school. Yeah. It was kind of unavoidable. Your kid got it. You got it. Exactly. So I'm just doing the best I can. We're making it through. But, you know, we're going to have fun because we have lots of fun stuff we're going to be talking about this week. And if you hear my voice going in and out, that explains why. (laughs) How are your chicks? My chicks are getting so big. Oh, my goodness. Really big. Yeah. Our first batch of chicks is really big. They're all absolutely gorgeous. The silver lace coach in Emmeline is absolutely stunning. I mean, she's just one of the most beautiful pullets I've ever seen. And now we have the gorgeous chicks from Murray McMurray. Yes. We're recording a day or two before we have them in hand. But by the time this comes out, they will be in our hands and you will be seeing them on our socials. (laughs) We're so, so excited. Have Uh, you decided on names for yours? We have only one name. So once we see them, the girls and I will sit down and brainstorm names for the other two. That's the fun part. And then they kind of grow into their name once you name them. You're like, you can't imagine calling them anything else. I know that you have names, but let's keep that under wraps. Next week, we'll bring out our names, what we all decided. And then you guys are going to be listening like, what are they? I'm pretty sure no one's that eager to hear what the names are. (laughs) Well, I am. Look, I got nothing else going on. I haven't been out of the house in nine days. This is big for me. I'm going to say this before we move on. The day before I tested positive, I had a big burst of energy. remember talking to you throughout the day and I was like, I weeded this garden and I did this path and I did this path. I should have known. I got so much done that day that it was my psyche preparing like, you're not getting anything done for two weeks, lady. Oh, that's what I was. <laughs> but I did manage yeah. to get some weeding done and Joe noticed this time. Good. <laughs> okay. So if we could ask everybody a big favor, if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. We love reading those reviews. It makes our day and it does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit subscribe because you will never miss an episode and that helps in our growth also. A gigantic thank you to our most recent reviewers. The one that sticks in my head is Rotten Cheese. So thank you to all of our reviewers, including Rotten Cheese. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is share episodes on social media and tell your friends about us. You can visit our Etsy shop, check out the t-shirts that we have for sale, become a patron of the show, visit patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies, check out our levels of membership there. 
The hand level membership, which is the highest, comes with a once monthly Zoom happy hour meeting, which is really a lot of fun. It's a great group. Love those ladies. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our show notes, use our affiliate links, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. You can receive 25% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus all products ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens or ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code COFFEELADIES25. Try it today. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chicken? Of course. Then, yeah. Let me just take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with the chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the April box, I absolutely love the big pack of greens and fodder seeds and the sparkly chicken earrings. Those bath bombs smell so good. And that wind chime is going to look so cute out in my run. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. It's such a great deal. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. And this week's Breed Spotlight, we are doing the Long Crowers. This week, we're not doing just one breed. We're talking about the whole group of Long Crowers. I want to say there's between like 15 and 20 different Long Crower breeds. There are a lot of them we have listed here. And they're a group of chicken that are known for their Long Crows. They're quite comical. You can go on and look up videos on YouTube and different places and hear them. And if you need a smile or a laugh during the day, that is something to look up because it'll definitely give you a laugh. You know I love them. The crow can last as long as 60 seconds. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're crowing, 60 seconds is a long long time. time. Most long crowers average around 15 seconds and 30 to 35 seconds is considered very good. So the thing to remember is as the rooster gets older, the crowing will become longer because they're more of a crotchety old man and they want everybody to know they're crowing. They've built up their lung strength over the years. And here's what we entertain ourselves with. Long crowing contests are very popular and we do watch the long crowing contests. There's a lot of them in Asia. A lot of the long crowing contests. Malaysia is a number one spot where you look up and you're going to find these long crowing contests. People spend a lot of time with these long crowers. They want everybody to hear it. And believe me, we want to hear them. You can also find the laughing chicken contests on YouTube. Oh, yeah. But that's different. The long crower is simply crowing. I just want to put a word in here for my favorite. The Denisley long crower tends to have the longest lasting crow. So they have the record. I don't know if they hold a record. They just tend to, on the average, have the longest crow. My question is, is there a Guinness Book of World Records for the long crower? According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the longest cock crow ever recorded was 23.6 seconds by a rooster named Tugaru Ono 94. This took place in Nagano, Japan on May 8, 1995. I don't think that can be correct if the Denisley Long Crowers are hitting 30 seconds. I guess the difference is this was done for the Book of World Records. Exactly. We're hearing by mouth or by just unofficial videos that these crows can go 30 seconds to 60 seconds. But officially, in the Guinness Book of World Records, it's 23 points. Yeah, it is a long crow. There's also a video going around of a rooster that passes out after a really, really long crow. I have seen it. I don't know. Maybe he's really old. He doesn't have he's the wind in his lungs anymore. And, yeah, he's knocking out the wind. He's like the fainting goats, you know, oh, like it's just falling the over. The fainting goats, yeah. <laughs> the other thing is when we're talking about long crowers and we're talking about crowing, we're talking about these are all boys. This yes. isn't going to be a hen. Right. And if you're going to have this chicken, you're going to have a boy. And you have to be aware in your neighborhood if you can have roosters, especially if you have a long crower. 
I'm telling you right now, there is a Denise Lee long crower in my future. At some point, this will happen. Oh, I could see that. The thing about the long crowers, most of them tend to be from Asia. The earliest known reference to a long crower was during the Han Dynasty in China. So around 48 BC, they're ancient birds. They've been around for thousands of years. There are still several varieties in China and Japan. I can see in the olden days, this rooster being owned by the royalty and then bringing them out for an after dinner entertainment. I can see it. When you think about it, I'm sure they have practical abilities, but they tend to be like a novelty to people. Exactly. You could see them belonging to wealthy people. The other popular spot where you find a lot of long crowers is in the Balkans, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. As we were saying, there's at least 20 different varieties of long crowers. So some of the countries, we said China and Japan and Turkey. Yeah, there's Germany, Russia, Ukraine, Kosovo, Serbia. And then back in Asia, you're looking at India, Indonesia, and Java, and U.S. They're a recent entry. The American long crower is derived primarily from the Denizli long crower from Turkey. Right. And when you look at them, you can see it. There are a few other breeds mixed in there, but it's heavily derivative from the the Denizli. They are not accepted by the American Poultry Association. Shocker. Right. (laughs) There's three or four varieties of the long crower in the Balkans, and they're not all the same. There are some clear differences between them. So my guess is they were imported from places in Asia, and then like little geographic areas had their own breeding program. So they oh, evolved yeah. as these really distinct-looking chickens. We're going to have this list up on our show notes so that you can clearly see every breed that we're talking about. And this is a good thing that if you're sitting there and you have 10 extra minutes and you don't really know what to look up, this is a good look up just to know these long crowers. And you can look up all the different breeds and see how they look a little bit different. But there's two takeaways. The first is they crow really long. And the second is they're all boys. And that's why you're getting them. So we're not going to be talking about eggs with this breed spotlight. We're going to be talking about crowing. Right. Like we said, there's a really wide variety in their appearance. Besides the Denizli long crowers, my other favorites are the crested long crowers. The Kosovo. Yes. The Sanjak and the Kosovo, both of them are from the Balkans. The other thing is there's a lot of different body types among the long crowers. Some are lean and they have long straight combs. That's the Denizli. And then some of them have the horn-shaped comb, like the... Of course. Yeah, the Polish. I guess there might be some of that breed mixed into them at that point. There's a very wide variety of the way they look. And if you want one for your flock... You have many different physical characteristics that you can choose from. And yeah, the crest, it's like a mohawk crest on the Kosovo. Yeah. It's really cool looking. They do remind me of... I know who they remind you of. The Pavlovskaya. That and the Spitzhavens. Yeah, they both have that kind of tufty crest. Yeah. And some sit taller than others. Some sit shorter. Some have that longer leg like the melee chicken has. And some are shorter to the ground. So it's all in personal preference and what you want a rooster to look like. And if you want a rooster for your flock for protection, why not get a long crower? Because this thing's going to crow and keep everything away (laughs) because it's going to want to come up. They can have a bunch of different leg colors. We found everything from green legs to slate colored legs. Yeah. And this is worth noting too. There's no American Poultry Association standard for the American long crower. But a couple of these breeds are popular enough in their own country that they do have a breed standard in their country of origin. When we did the research looking up the videos, a lot of men yes. have these roosters. Yeah. It kind of goes with your shoe size and how long your crow is. Oh, my God. <laughs> God how long does your cock crow? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can do 35 seconds. Can you beat that? You do see a lot of men who have them, and they love to show off the long crowing. As we said, they're they're more like novelty, but they're also very popular in several countries as showbirds. I could see that. They tend to be, not all of them, but they do tend to be in the medium to small body category. So they're not really considered dual purpose birds. It is worth noting, though, that some of the breeds do have hens who are decent egg layers. Yes. So there is that. And some of them are quite pretty, like the Denizli long crower hens, I think are beautiful little birds. 
I was trying to do some research to find out where this variant of the long crow was coming from. If you remember back when we did the Arcana, I had found someone mention that at one point, one of the ancient foundation breeds for the Arcana was a laughing chicken. Yes. I couldn't find any more information than that. So I did the same with the long crow. I went back as far as I could. I didn't find any other information. It's worth noting that the red jungle fowl, and we know that a huge chunk of chicken DNA comes from the red jungle fowl, their crow is very similar to the modern rooster. So it's okay. not them. They don't have no. So we don't know where it comes from, but it does make me happy every time I hear it. We figured that we would do this breed spotlight because it made us so happy to watch the videos. And they are, in a good way to put it, they're pets. And people love them for their quality of their long crow. And that's a good thing for this rooster. We love seeing roosters as pets. And this is an amazing story of them. And there's all different kinds to look up. And here, if you can get a husband and wife team and get some eggs and keep the lines going, that would be great too. At some point, we'll probably do a spotlight on the Denise Long Crower because it is my favorite of a bunch. And you can find a lot more information on them. Some of these, I have names of the breeds, but I simply can't find much information on them at all. Right. There is a Brazilian Long Crower, the Galar Musico. There's the Yurlovsky Long Crower, which is from somewhere in the geography of Russia. There's a lot of Long Crowers. Yeah, there's a lot. India. I don't even know how to pronounce half of these. So we'll have the list up. If you're interested in adding a rooster to your flock and you want a little fun, where can we find these roosters? In the U.S., there are several farms where you can get hatching eggs and breeding stock for the American long crower. Greenfire Farm imported both the Denizli and the Kosovo long crowers in 2019. And I didn't see the Kosovo's offered, but you can get the Denise Lees as they old chicks. Oh, that's cool. And that's one where you're like, I want the boy. I love the turnaround and all right. of this. It's spotlighting the boy for something else besides us saying, oh, no, we all want the hen. I love right. doing this because it puts a spotlight on the boys. And it's like, we want the boys for the long crowing. I love it. There's also the German long crower, as you mentioned earlier, the Brigitte crower. And it also comes in a bantam version. And oh, wow. I got to tell you, a bantam long crower is something I can get on board with. Yes, I can right? see that chicken in your flock. I apologize to our German listeners if I'm saying this completely wrong. The Bergisha crower, you can find in Europe. So maybe for our UK and French and German listeners, it's something more readily available there. If anyone out there is listening and you have a long crower, send us pictures and audio. We would love to hear his crow. Oh, yeah. We want some audio. We play it on the show. (laughs) I can definitely see you with a long crower. No doubt in my mind. Oh, I would love it. The neighbors might not love it, but I would love it. Rooster number nine and wait till you hear his crow. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, take a look at Roosty's store on Amazon.com. We've personally tested their products and we're huge fans. They have their famous nesting pads, those fantastic chick water and feeder kits, do-it-yourself port feeder kits, water or nipple and water or cup kits. And you don't even need to drive to the stores. They're all available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Visit Amazon.com and check out the Roosty's range or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so are we ready to move on to main topic? Yeah. Yeah. We have a double main topic this week because there's two things that we wanted to touch base on, and they're each in themselves not big enough for us to give a full main topic, but together they work well. So the first thing that we want to talk about is taking chicks outside. Yes. So we're talking about when we take the chicks outside just to get some sunlight and grass and that sort of thing. Yes. And then we're talking about the appropriate ages to put your chicks outside permanently. And even more importantly, the appropriate age at which to integrate your chicks with an existing flock. 
Yes. So let's start with talking about what we do. We get our chicks. They're just a day or two old. We keep them in at least for the first two weeks or so. Under that light, if they're out, it's for a quick picture on ourselves and then back under the light because that warmth is so important for those chicks at that time that they can't be out. Now we're coming into summer. So you can potentially, if we had an 85 or a 90 degree day and you have a young chick that's under two weeks of age, come outside on you still for a few minutes. But I would still recommend right back under the heat lamp so that they definitely have that warmth. Yeah. When do you start bringing yours out for play? Anytime after the two week mark, I think probably for me, it's like six to eight weeks is when I really start getting them outside for sunshine and grass. They're big enough to fend for themselves. And by that, I don't mean they're unsupervised. I just mean they're big enough to run around and carry on and get some benefit from it. Dig a little bit, have some sunbathing. But as I said, they're always supervised. And there's one thing to note about the sunshine. Even though chicks have been under a heat lamp, They're not used to sunshine. You have to gradually get them used to the strength of the sun on their combs and on their skin. So we would start with maybe 10 minutes and Mm -hmm. then build up until they can take a longer period. Usually around three weeks, weather permitting. We've gone from winter to summer almost at this point. Yeah. We had no spring. Our spring was very, very cold here. So they are just now at seven and eight weeks of age getting outside to play more. I have them in their pop-up with their brooder plates and I move the pop-up outside when it's warm enough, if it's 85 or 80 or over to let them get some. And when they're in the grass, they are only supervised. We put down a pop-up too. We have a pop-up with no bottle. So they'll be sitting in the grass and we put them in the pop-up and we stay right there with them. And then when they start to get tired or whatever, we carry them back in. We talk about the pop-up so much. It's integral even with your chick keeping. We believe every chicken lady or man should have this in your arsenal, pop-up cages, so that when you move from a solid brooder, you're moving to a pop-up, and the pop-up is easily moved in and out so that they can go in and out throughout the day and be safe, and you're always out there with them. Now, I take them out and let them run the grass in a small area with me when it is warm enough. I think the temperatures really have something to play with when they go outside and how feathered they are. So between six and eight weeks, we know that they have a lot of feathering. They can be outside for a half an hour, an hour, either in a pop-up or supervised with you, both supervised. Right. The other thing that we need to bring up is integration. Integration is really important we hold off past this point and give them time to grow and become more comparable in size to the chickens that they're going into. Right. The simplest way to think about this is if you have an established group of, let's just say hens for the sake of argument, do you have your hens who are in charge and hens lower down in the pecking order? None of these hens raise chicks. So when you're bringing these strange chicks, and I'm still calling them chicks because at eight weeks, six weeks, They're still physically small. You bring them in and put them in with big girls. The big girls are going to say, hey, those babies are dragging us down. We don't want them around. And you risk the babies being attacked by the bigger hens. I always like to compare it to in human terms. And then that way I feel like everyone can kind of understand and see it a little bit more, even as if you had somebody knock on your door of your home and say, I'm here, I'm living with you. And you never met them before in your entire life. It's really hard to open up the door and say, welcome, come on in. But if you meet a friend, you talk on the phone, you meet a few times, you have lunch together, you become friends, then that friend needs a place to stay. That's going to be an easier open the door and let them in at that point. But at that point, you're talking about a friend who's the same size as you, not necessarily still a baby. Size does make a huge factor. They have to be able to defend themselves. If they're anything smaller than the other hens, they have no chance. Right. So that's why we always say you don't even want to start to think about outside living full time until at least four months of age. We've seen a lot lately. We've had a lot of people tell us this. Okay, your chickens are fully feathered at eight weeks and they can probably come off heat. Sure. But that does not mean they're ready to be integrated. This is a hard and fast rule for us. 
We do not begin interation until our chicks are 16 weeks old. And even then, we take it slowly. Yeah, we have a whole episode out there on integration where we right. talk about exactly what we do. So the thing to remember is size matters. When they're smaller than the other chickens, they're not going to be able to defend themselves. And also taking things slowly will help you in the long run. If you have the mindset of this is going to take me two months to do, then you're setting yourself up for success from the beginning because you're not going to be rushing things. Now, as we're getting into warmer weather, we may be able to free range again soon once we hit 85, 90 for multiple days in a row. And I generally start after four months free ranging a little bit together so that everybody can meet on a common ground and not in the run itself. Yeah. And then I divide the run and then I let them see each other without getting to each other. And then after that happens for a while, we take the fencing away and we see how it goes. By, by that point, like you said, they're already like five, five and a half months old, right? Or even six months old. And if you set yourself up to not put a lot of pressure on yourself for this to happen instantly, you'll be much happier in the long run. I've had some very long integrations. I've also, in the case of gentle breeds, had integrations that were less than two weeks. Remember last year? Yeah. World's easiest integration. I did nothing. I had that little house in there. I saw it on Facebook Marketplace. Joe and I drove an hour. We picked up this little separation coop that we sat in there for like three days. We took it up and everybody was great. It was the right. most laid back flock ever. Yeah, That was the easiest integration I've ever had. And I've had other really, really hard integrations where you're almost pulling your hair out because you're so frustrated. And what I've learned over all the years is don't put that pressure on yourself. It will happen. Right. It has to happen on their own time and on their own way and getting them outside. So if they're fully feathered, that's not a, hey, you have to take them out. That's a, hey, let's go out to play. You can put them in their own coop at that point. Depending on your weather, I might still have a heat source, depending on yeah. the birds and your weather. Yeah. But for integration, that's a no. It's not an appropriate age for integration. People have probably done it successfully. People have done all kinds of things successfully that maybe they shouldn't do. That's going to be the exception rather than the rule. If you want the full talk on integration, go to episode 24. Give that one a listen. We talk in detail of how to integrate bullets and how we both do it. Fiona as well. Fiona essentially has the same rule we do. No integration before 16 weeks. Okay, so let's move on. We've had some questions about this. It is, why are my chickens eating these eggs? Eating their own eggs or someone else's eggs, yeah. Yes. So we figured we would address it today and give some options on what you can do and give some reasons why. Right. And then that way you might be able to understand a little bit more why it's happening. So nutritional deficiencies are the first thing. Number one. It's often calcium or protein. Eggs are full of calcium and protein. So your chickens might be craving something, their body needs something, and they go for eggs. They do. The chickens are very smart in that way. All these people who think that birds aren't intelligent or chickens are intelligent is like, hey, you obviously don't have chickens or else you would understand that these birds know what their body needs and they know where to go to get it if they're not getting it. Other things that can happen is a thin shelled egg that breaks in the nest box. Well, I have yet to meet a hen who could control herself when an egg was broken in front of her. Me too. Like they go crazy. It's like jaws. They go right for it. And if it's soft shell, somebody's going in there instantly, like, boom, breaking it, yep. that's it. They cannot contain themselves. One reason is they're yummy. They like to eat them. Yep. They eat everything. So if for some reason the soft shell eggs, they're more prone to eating those than a hard shell egg. But right. they are not going to sit here and daintily not peck at an egg if they want it. They will yeah. they won't eat it. The other possibility is if you don't have enough bedding where you don't have, say, a nesting pad in your nest box, hen lays an egg and hits the ground and cracks, again, those girls are going to gobble that egg up. This is where I love our Roosty's nesting pads that yeah. uh, Roosty has on Amazon. You put these pads in the bottom. You can put a little bit of shaving over top. It gives a soft spot for your egg to land when it comes yep. out. If the egg breaks, they're going to eat it. That's generally what's going to happen. So like Holly Ann said, giving a nice soft place for this egg to land is number one. A big reason why chickens will do this sometimes, boredom. Yep. 
They're like, hey, I have nothing going on. So I'm going to eat this egg. Here it is. You have a board hen. She's probably in the coop causing trouble with the hens that are laying. And I've seen my hens try to roll other hens' eggs out. Oh, so all it. it takes is a peck in the right place. And, you know, there's a crack in the shell. The other thing is, right now I'm dealing with this, June, my lavender, is rolling eggs from one nest box to her nest box yep. because she's starting to go broody. So a broody yep. hen will take the eggs with her beak she and move them. them. With moving them, she might break them. And it's it, it's yeah. happened to me a few times. If that happens, they again can say, ooh, egg, and they're going to come down and start eating up. The other yeah. thing we want to say is, it, is it definitely a chicken? You want to make sure that you definitely know it's one of your chickens and not a squirrel, a raccoon, or a snake getting into your coop and taking the eggs. I've heard accounts that domestic dogs will go steal eggs. Oh. I don't know if you remember, were you here the day that River and Tulip knocked an entire dozen eggs off the counter? <laughs> no, no, no. I was aghast. They knocked an entire dozen eggs off the counter, and then they ate every single one of them. A whole they dozen were, raw eggs. They were feeling like Hulk Hogan. They are like, I need my raw eggs. Apparently. <laughs> if an egg falls on the floor here, I can't stop the dogs either. They're all They're over it. it. Everybody yep. loves eggs. They're good for you. <laughs> Chickens love their own eggs. It's just a fact of life. They might just think they're so delicious that they're like, I don't want my human to eat these. I'm going to eat these myself. So let's give everyone some solutions if you notice that your chickens are eating their own eggs. The easiest way to stop it is, if you have the time to do this, collect your eggs more often. Take a few walks out to the coop during the day. Get the eggs out of there. A hen who's bored and just looking for trouble, she'll stop if you keep taking the eggs away. Oh, yes. You have to get them out before they get to them and say, hmm, this looks good. The other thing that we need you to do is take a look at the diet and make sure that the protein and calcium levels in your commercial feed are at the proper place. Also, we 1 million percent recommend to have free choice oyster shells available to chickens all the time because they're going to take in their extra calcium with that. And if they have that, they're less likely to eat an egg to get that calcium. Make sure everything's balanced. And that goes for treats too. If you're giving treats daily, that's fine. Make sure it's an appropriate amount. My girls get probably some veg and fruit on the daily, and they right, get right. grublies every day. But it's one handful of grublies spread across all the chickens. Exactly. The other thing that we mentioned before is boredom can cause them to want to eat their eggs. So we talk about this all the time. Chickens are highly intelligent, and they need boredom busters. Yeah, just things to keep them busy so they're not spending their time in the coop harassing other hens. Don't forget that, like you were talking before about a broody hen who will steal another hen's eggs. Remember that when the girls are fighting over one box, it's not because they're stupid. It's because they're biologically driven to lay in a clutch yes. for better survival of their species. They want that broody hen to be able to sit on all the eggs at once. Right. The broody hen doesn't want to have to move the eggs. But I'll tell this story today because I slept for many hours this morning. I got up and then I went back to sleep for many hours. And then I'm like, okay, let me go check the chickens. And there was nest box drama. And I'm yeah. like, save this drama for your mama. I'm coming out here right now to check on you girls and figure out what's going on. So I see up, out, up, out, hear the noise. I look in there. You got somebody laying an egg. You got somebody staring at that one laying an egg. You got another one over here. And then I find an egg outside the coop because somebody couldn't wait long enough. Yeah. So it just came out. And then 20 minutes later, I come back and it's calm. And June, who is my lavender Orpington, who always goes broody now. She's my new broody. She has the eggs under her in one nest box. They're going to do what they need to do with the eggs to get them. You just need to keep an eye on them. And I didn't have yeah. the heart to take them from under her at that moment in time. Right, right. After all of that. She's awash with her own special brand of hormones. And the boredom busters go a long way because if you have hens who just need to get in their lay or do their thing, then they can go back out in the yard and take part in whatever's happening out there. Plastic chairs, extra logs, places for them to go up and climb. These things keep them happier so that they aren't going to be fixated on being inside the coop for a long time while egg laying is going on. High perches, low perches, things to get under, and dust baths. They're sort of your minimum for things to keep your hens occupied in the yard and out and away from the eggs. Definitely. 
So if anybody has any additional questions that we haven't answered, feel free to direct message us on social media or email us your questions, and we will definitely try to answer them to the best of our ability, hoping that if you do have an egg eater, that it's going to get better soon. It's not a forever. I mean, a lot of people will tell you, once they've got a taste, they'll never stop. And that's not true. No, there is hope. Okay, so let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. And this one is your recipe this week. Yeah, I've been making this one for a long, long time. I don't even remember where I got the original recipe. But this is my version of lemon egg soup. I think the recipe originally comes from a Greek recipe. I can see that with the lemon because Greek recipes are very high in lemon. Yeah, it's a super simple recipe. It makes some of the best soup I've ever had. I love this when I don't feel well. So you want some broth. Chicken broth if you're a meat eater, veggie broth if you're a vegetarian. You want some rice. I know we've had this conversation before. I know it's healthier, but I don't like brown rice. I like white rice. I'm the same way. I'm not a huge fan of brown rice. I have tried so many times over the years. I am a white rice kind of person. I love white rice. So you want about a quarter of a cup uncooked rice. I guess that's about a half of a cup cooked rice. Either one works. You can use leftover rice or you can use uncooked rice. You want a little bit of garlic. You want about a third of a cup of lemon juice. And you want one egg. And you want to beat the egg. Don't beat it to death. No, don't do that. You don't want to scramble it to within an inch of its life. Just lightly beat it. And then any spices that you want to add. You're going to start by heating up your broth. And you're going to stir the rice and the garlic in there. And let it simmer until it's cooked. It can take 15, 20, 25 minutes depending on your rice. You're going to turn the heat on low. In a separate bowl, you're going to put the lemon juice and the egg. You're going to mix them together, and then you're going to stir it into the soup. And the magic of the lemon keeps the egg from curdling. Right. It lets it blend into the soup. And at that point, once it's cooked through and everything's hot, serve it. It's that easy. You can throw some parsley and some salt and pepper. I like it with a little bit of dill sometimes. It's a great, easy recipe when you want healthy and you want protein along with some healthy carbs with some rice. And like you said, it's a great one when you're not feeling well. And I love adding greens to it. And you could even add whatever herb you have growing in the garden for whatever other side tastes that you want. I think there are plenty of versions of this soup that do have chicken in them. Okay. I learned it as a vegetarian recipe and I've always made it that way. But I'm sure you could add meat if you wanted. I would think thyme, lemon and thyme go really well together, that that would be a really good herb if you're growing it in your yard. Throw that in the soup, get that little mix of the lemon and the thyme in there with the egg, and it's healthy. It's very healthy. I've probably made it with thyme over the years. I love thyme, and I have a really nice thyme bush in the herb garden right now. I really love this with dill. Dill goes beautifully with the egg and the lemon. It just sort of brightens it. I haven't tried oregano, but I could see where a nice Italian oregano would be delicious in there. It's such a simple recipe that you can experiment, find what you really like. I do an egg bake that has dill. I love it. It brings in a whole different taste to the egg. So I can see where in a soup with eggs and broth, the dill would be really good also. It's so good. I love growing dill. It not only is amazing in egg dishes, it also makes a great bouquet. Good in tuna fish too. It is. So make this soup if you're not feeling well or if you're feeling great and you want a quick meal and use your eggs up, it's the way to go. And if you want to make a bigger amount of it, just double the ingredient sizes. So show us your pictures, tag us in the story. We would love to see it. Let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm actually really excited about this week's retail therapy. It's what I've been waiting for us to do because I think the stuff that we're going to talk about is beyond cool. Like, it's so cool that I think chicken ladies everywhere should not be without. So we're talking about vintage chicken barware. Mind blown. I am slowly been trying to collect this because it can be pricey when you go to find it because so many people want it that are chicken ladies out there. And I am one of those. And I know you are, too. I'm going to bring up a story a year or two ago when you found the glasses. I remember finding the glasses. I don't remember where I found them. You found them in the farmhouse basement. Is that what it was? Okay. And I remember you like sending me a picture of them and I was so jealous. You were like, oh my God, I think it was like a year or two ago. 
vintage chicken barware is such a thing, it's hard to find sometimes. In this case, it was a set of three shot glasses with a rooster in gold or gilt on the glass. They're bigger than like the modern shot glass. They sort of have a curvy appearance to them. They're definitely mid-century. Here's the thing, though. I've never identified the maker of them. Sometimes it's hard. And even when you do a photo search of something, you might find somebody else still selling it and they might not know the information either. So the first thing that I always like to do when I'm looking up for vintage chicken barware is I Google vintage chicken barware and look at (laughs) images. I can look at images all day long of this stuff. And the glasses, there is a plethora of sizes, of design, of different types of glasses. I love mid-century barware already myself. Mid-century was kind of in that era. It was slowly turning over, but there were still chicken ladies out there. And so much of this was made because people wanted to eat off of and show off things that they were into in their own lives. So many things during that time were made with chickens on them because everyone had chickens in their backyards. I think some of it was like a counterculture reaction too, because everything was going streamlined and modern and industrial. And a hen in an apron was sort of homey. It's a weird juxtaposition to what was going on in the world, but yeah. So you could find it. And there's actually, as of late, been a lot more vintage chicken barware out there to be found because I always go on and search it. Now, my key places I go are Etsy and eBay. Right. I am also looking in the wild when I'm not sick at the thrift stores, looking for barware that someone found the chicken stuff and they don't like it and it gets given to the thrift store. So yeah, I would love to find them in the wild. But eBay has lots and lots of chicken barware. Yes. Different types of glasses for different drinks. So you have the shot glasses, but you can also find, say, roly-poly whiskey glasses. Love those. I'm seeing a lot of shakers. I love vintage glass drink shakers. Yeah. With chickens on them. So cool. I'm like, I need these. Joe's going to be like, not the bar. Chickens can't take over the bar too. I don't know. They might be able to. I have not had much luck finding them in the wild. Me either. I feel like there are certain brands that you'll find on, say, eBay or Etsy Libby is a big one. Libby has some sets with mostly roosters, but they have some really nice mixed drink glasses sets. It's the coolest thing ever. It's very cool. Oh my God. I just found a 1940s roosters glass cocktail shaker. I'm looking at it. Is it Libby, the Chanticleer pattern? It's $275. No, that's a different one because the one I'm looking at is $14.99. The one I'm looking at is the Hour Shop, and it's classic from the 1940s. Yeah, that's cool. And I like that one. The more popular the chickens get now, the higher price that these objects are going to get online. Yeah. The one person that we can mention is Kate Richards at Drinking with Chickens. She does tend to have some flash sales for some vintage barware for chicken stuff. She is an amazing finder. She does awesome job. And she sells out very, very quickly. You have to know when her flash sales are. I'm guessing that these are easier to find on the West Coast than the East Coast. Probably. There's a lot of rooster bottle openers out there now. I really like these. I will say that I don't drink that much. So for me, something like the Libby Cordial glasses would be really nice. Yeah. I'll have a drink of wine here and there. So a a nice small glass. But you guys are really into the mixed drinks, into the cocktails. We are. So this stuff, I'm like, I want to be drinking out of something with chickens on it. And it makes it even more swanky. Everyone out there might be seeing our vintage chicken bar happy hour that may be happening soon to celebrate some milestones that we have coming up. So I may be over collecting to use for that little happy hour that we're going to be throwing. And that's (laughs) going to be so much fun. They have these cocktail stars from the 1920s. Art Deco. Oh my God. That's really cool. It's a must have. If you don't feel well, you're sitting there and your mind's still like you want to do something. That's what I do. Okay. I'm going to look up vintage chicken barworks. It makes me happy. It makes me smile. And I'm going to see what I can find. A lot of times if you find something on eBay and you want to pay a little bit less, you can add it to your wish list. And then sometimes you'll get an offer for less. That's right. Who are some of the other makers? We know Libby, Federal Glass Company made some. Culver did. 
I would imagine probably then like Hazel Atlas. Yes. They were big time from really the 20s to the 50s, all the glass companies. Libby was really number one. I mean, and Libby's still going today. And it's just amazing to find them. I don't know if anybody out there has some stuff, but I would love to see what you have. I'm a kid in the candy store on eBay when it comes to vintage chicken barware. Here's one vintage barware rooster shaker and ice bucket. That's cool. Well, I would imagine like any other mid-century modern barware or early 20th century barware, the more complete the set, the costlier it is. Yeah. And I actually, Joe and I both collect vintage barware for our bar, stuff that isn't chicken also. But if you had a chicken on it, it's going to be on my radar. We have gotten some good deals at different antique stores of people who are just like, they're done. They want to sell the stuff. We found some Culver sets some Hazel Atlas sets, and we will buy up all that kind of glassware because we love it. There's something more nostalgic about drinking out of that, a nice cocktail out of really cool glass. It's also a fun thing to search because it just shows you how styles have changed. Some of these glasses, people don't usually make the kind of drinks that would have been served in some of these glasses. The history that you love is seeing those different time periods and how it's changed over the years. And I see right now a call to go back in time, which is kind of cool. The retro, the vintage, all that stuff. What was once old is new again. That's a trend that you've seen across the world. Some of it was sparked by, say, the COVID outbreak, where people wanted to slow down. They wanted to live a lot more slowly. And a slower pace of living does lend itself to you making artisan cocktails with your herb garden and your fresh aid. That's not something you can do if you're running from thing to thing. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention, Alyssa gave me the dessert wine glass set for Mother's Day with the chickens. And I'm going to be showcasing that on our Instagram this week. When I opened up the box with those glasses, I was like, ah, (laughs) I was so happy. You have a maker for them? No, I do not. Okay. See if we can do some more research and track it down. We'll do some more research for sure. And I will put a picture of them up. They are the cutest things, dessert wine glasses with the chickens all the way around. Love them. And I believe she found them on eBay. So it does pay to have friends who know what you love because they're also looking out for you too. Yep. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Sure. Next week, we're going to be spotlighting the extraordinarily popular I Am Samani. It is popular. Our main topic, due to popular demand, mites and lice in your coop and flock. I'm itchy already. No. Our recipe is rhubarb custard cake. The rhubarb is ready to go here on my farm. I can't wait. And retail therapy is Fitz and Floyd Chicken Kitchenware. We love it. And it's another, you can get it vintage and new. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.